Good evening and welcome to No Spin. I'm Nidhi Razdan. The global economy is in trouble, big trouble. The International Monetary Fund or the IMF has slashed its forecast for global growth this year to 3.2% from 3.6%. The world's economic growth in fact had rebounded to 6.1% in 2021 after COVID, but now 2022 will see a major slowdown. The United States is on the verge of a recession. Inflation there is at a decade's high. China's economy has slowed down. In our neighborhood, we've seen Sri Lanka's economic crisis and the consequences of that with its president being forced to flee as anger built up against him and his government. Pakistan is also facing record high inflation. The UK is facing a massive cost of living crisis that has turned into a political issue for voters as well. The headwinds are here in India too, and we can all feel it. India has been battling inflation, a falling rupee and high unemployment for some time. Despite all of this, Finance Minister Nirmala Sitaraman has emphatically told Parliament that India is doing better when compared to the rest of the world. She has said there is no question of India going into recession. She cited the statements of former RBI Governor Raghuram Rajan, where he recently praised the efforts of India's central bank, the RBI, in increasing India's foreign exchange reserves and ruled out a Sri Lanka-like situation here in India. So what is the economic outlook for India in the short term and the long term. We have uh, joining us tonight the former governor of the RBI, Mr. Raghuram Rajan, live from the United States. Mr. Rajan, thank you so much uh, for being with us on NDTV this evening. Uh, straight off, do you agree with Finance Minister Nirmala Sitaraman when she says that India is actually better off uh, than some of the other leading economies of the world? Um, I think it depends a little on what you mean better off. I mean, certainly we have higher growth than uh, many economies in the world. The question is, what level of growth do we need? Uh, because we are a poorer country. And uh, the, the problem to some extent is that our growth uh, for the last uh, so many years has been insufficient to create the levels of employment that we absolutely need. You can see that in, for example, the 12, 12 and a half million people a couple of years ago applying for the 35,000 railway jobs. You can see that in the hungry people uh, in protesting on the streets when Agnipath is, uh, is announced. So uh, my sense is, uh, yes, we are growing faster than many other large economies, but we need more growth to create the jobs that our people absolutely need. So can we rest at this place and say we've done enough? Absolutely not. We need to do more. So what would that kind of growth be that would generate those kind of jobs? The IMF is talking about, uh, I think, 7.4% for India. Uh, India's own projections are at, uh, similar at about 7.2%, 7.3%. So what is the kind of growth that you think uh, would, would be enough? Well, part of the problem is this 7% is uh, partly a rebound from uh, pretty bad rates of growth uh, a couple of years ago. So we're coming back. For example, this year our service sector has come back. All that is good. Uh, and I don't think 7% is to be sneered at. But, but certainly, uh, you have to look at what is long-term sustainable. Uh, a lot of worries are about the next fiscal year. Uh, because after the rebound phase, how fast are we going to grow? Uh, people like JP Morgan have uh, pegged us in the 4 to 5 region uh, over the next year. And 4 to 5 as a, as a sustained pace of growth is really too slow to create the kinds of jobs th that we need. A lot of this uh, growth is also jobless growth. We're not creating jobs even with the growth that we have. And so I would say jobs are uh, essentially task one for the economy. And we have to figure out how do we uh, create those jobs, uh, decent jobs. We don't need to have everybody be a software programmer uh, or a consultant. But decent jobs that get people out of, uh, you know, low productivity agriculture and out of backbreaking construction work. Construction can be an interim phase, but we have to get them into service jobs, into uh, manufacturing jobs that are better. Uh, in fact, that's a very important point you raised because there's a recent study uh, that actually looks at the quality of, of jobs in this country and the fact that while more, more and more people have moved away from agriculture and farming over the years, uh, they're not really getting good quality jobs. They're mostly in the informal sector. And the only industry that's really seemed to have generated good jobs in the last few years has been uh, IT, uh, which is not surprising. Uh, you know, your thoughts on that? I mean, how, how, do, we, how do we change that? How do we get, how do we get the good jobs? 
Well, absolutely. And, and I think, unfortunately, there are no shortcuts here. Uh, we certainly have to increase the skill base of our economy, the education base of our people. That is, uh, we have to make sure they go into school, they get a quality education in school. One of the big worries over the pandemic is that so many of our poorer kids have been uh, two years without schooling. And when you assess what they actually know, it's, it's not just the two missed years, but they've also forgotten what they knew before they went in. So there's a very grave danger that we have in a generation uh, which graduates from school over the next 10 years, which actually is uh, not uh, skilled enough uh, in what they're supposed to know. We need a lot of remedial education uh, to make up for the learning that has been lost during COVID. Uh, so that's, that's the first task. Let's get uh, workers who are capable of, uh, of doing uh, good jobs, uh, that's, that's the, the first task. And then, of course, we have to create the good jobs also. My sense is that if we can create the skill base, uh, the jobs will start coming. People will start seeing in India there's a labor force which is uh, relatively available and they will start creating more jobs for those people. Now, of course, we have to uh, keep an open economy uh, so that we can attract those kinds of investments. Uh, our own uh, industrialists have to invest more. But uh, I think, in a sense, you have to create the environment for that, them to do more of that. And the first part of that environment is make sure that we have uh, the quantum of skilled workers that we need. When you say that uh, you, you have to create an environment also for, for uh, our own industrialists to invest in our own country, what's holding them back, you think, at the moment? I mean, is it just about sentiment or uh, is it that we're still so mired in red tape and, you know, you have the income tax department and the ED and everyone going after everyone uh, on a regular basis? Is that also what's holding things back? It's a little bit of everything, right? Uh, start first with the fact that the rules keep changing. So uh, you you know, tariffs go up, tariffs go down. Um, uh, unfortunately, in recent times, they've typically been going up. And so you have no idea whether a certain input that you're buying will be available at the same price or will it suddenly get protected? And then you have to buy it at a higher price, which makes you less competitive in global markets. So, so one of the uh, issues is the changing nature of the rules. We have to maintain a little more stability there. The second is, yes, the government has been working on improving the doing business environment. But in practical terms, when you ask business people, they still suffer from excessive inspectors, uh, you know, uh, rules that are archaic, that are complex, and they get entwined in them. I mean, just look at you know, things like money laundering rules uh, are not very clear. And I, I have to say that having been uh, at the Reserve Bank and trying to uh, take an axe to some of these rules, uh, it, th there's a whole history of these rules and you have to keep working at it to simplify them so that people know what they're liable for. Um, so I think these are some of the things we have to work on. But of course, in addition, we need to improve the quality of the infrastructure, the logistics that uh, these uh, business people face, the access to power. I mean, we've had power shortages once again, uh, especially with the availability of coal. All these are things that eventually add up. So my sense is we have work to do. Uh, the, the last point on business investment is, unfortunately, at this point, uh, despite growth, uh, we find capacity utilization is still relatively low. In other words, uh, we need more demand going forward uh, for businesses to feel confident there will be sufficient demand for them to make big investments. Uh, right now, that's not the case. So I think we can do more, uh, we should do more, but there are a number of uh, areas we need to act on. You mentioned the words open economy and it, that it's important for India to, to remain an open economy. But how does that square off then with the Atma Nirbharta that the government is, is trying to promote? I mean, is there a danger of this becoming a very protectionist kind of policy? There is a danger. I, 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 will, uh, uh, I, I do worry about it. And, and I do worry that uh, all these schemes, the PLI scheme, for example, are untested. Uh, are they really going to sustainably increase manufacturing in this country 
or are they going to take us back to a protected high cost economy where it's subsidies that encourage manufacturing rather than the fact that manufacturers find a competitive environment uh, an environment where they have access uh, to uh, to power to good labor etc and therefore uh, manufacture here. My worry is at this point we are embarking on uh, a PLI for a whole lot of uh, of uh, industries uh, and in that process uh, we don't know uh, at the end of it whether we will we'll create a sustainable manufacturing sector or whether we have uh, sort of re-inherited uh, a license permit Raj kind of structure where a few industrialists are benefited by the PLI scheme. Uh, they also have a lot of protection from foreign imports and uh, essentially by that they inflict higher costs on the rest of the economy including on our consumers. Uh, I think the jury is still out but I worry at the pace at which we are uh, expanding this to sector after sector without knowing if it actually works. Coming to the to the rupee and to inflation, what what, what are your thoughts on how, how low the rupee could go? Uh, I mean, some are, uh, some in the government are trying to spin it with a silver lining, or, or it's good for exports. But in, in the long run, it's actually pretty bad for all of us. Uh, in in you know, even in our most day-to-day -day lives, uh, how low do you predict the rupee could be by the end of this year? Well, uh, foreign exchange uh, uh, predictions are often a fool's game because uh, they could, you know, markets are pretty efficient. Uh, they they are better than us at at telling us where the rupee should be. Uh, I think the uh, often uh, the exchange rate is uh, is seen as a measure of economic competence. Uh, my sense is we shouldn't make that judgment. Unfortunately, too many politicians make that judgment. Uh, let the rupee do what it will. I think the more important issue is to get inflation under control. Once inflation is under control, uh, then uh, I think the rupee will find the appropriate level given the state of our exports, given the state of our imports, uh, and it will be what is necessary to bridge the gap. The key, again and again, uh, I keep emphasizing, is to get inflation under control. Now, on inflation, the level of inflation certainly is much higher than we would desire, and that is for sure. At 7%, it's above the RBI's target range. And, and I think, uh, you know, uh, it's, it's hard to make out whether the worst is over, whether there's more inflation to come. Certainly, there are some positive signs in the world economy because of the world slowing. Commodity prices are falling. Uh, with the agreement on wheat, wheat prices yes. will uh, moderate. And of course, when wheat prices moderate, uh, you know, other grain prices also moderate because uh, people were substituting away to rice. Now they will say, okay, there's enough wheat. Uh, and so in general, grain prices can moderate. There's some moderation on, on, on um, uh, vegetables and, and fruits that we can see in India. So in general, uh, at least, uh, you know, looking forward, there seems some hope that uh, then inflation will come down. But these are very high rates of inflation and certainly rates of inflation outside the RBI's norm. So the RBI is working. It has more work to do. I hope it is successful. But to at this point to argue that inflation is not a problem would I think be overstating the case. And certainly because uh, inflation is high in certain elements like food, and fuel, they affect the budgets, especially of poor people, substantially. So it is a concern. So therefore, that comparison uh, that has been, at least by politicians, some politicians like Rahul Gandhi, for example, made that co comparison with Sri Lanka, saying that India could go the Sri Lanka way. Uh, an exaggeration, you would say, or just, just not the right comparison to make? I would say there's a different uh, reason than, than today is saying we'll go the Sri Lanka way because of, uh, of our current uh, economic situation. I think we're far from that. But I would say that on another uh, element, which is uh, on uh, you know, the issue of minorities and their place in the nation, uh, Sri Lanka uh, certainly had a large minority, the Tamils. And in the 80s, when they had a problem of jobless uh, growth, uh, they start, uh, politicians found it uh, particularly easy to deflect uh, some of the attention to the problem of minorities and made a bogeyman out of the Tamils, uh, essentially creating the kind of strife that, that uh, you know, resulted in civil war and eventually in a huge problem for Sri Lanka. Uh, 
I would say the roots of Sri Lanka's current economic problems lie in that troubled history of the past. Otherwise, they were actually a, quite a successful middle-income country. And I think uh, Mr. Gandhi, uh, certainly in pointing out the parallels, is talking as much about the, uh, the fact that, uh, you know, uh, we are uh, sort of in danger of demonizing our minorities and creating the kind of internal strife that leads nowhere good. And I would say that to my mind is the lesson from Sri Lanka. Let us work for communal harmony and uh, unity of the country. Uh, that will save, uh, serve us well, not just in, in uh, protecting us from the kinds of, uh, uh, of incidents that took place in Sri Lanka, but also will be strong for the economy. But I would say, uh, the, you know, it, it's uh, as much for the integrity of the country as for anything else. Well, most importantly for the integrity of the country and I think for all of us as a society. But I, I just wanted to get a sense from you that when there is this kind of communal strife that makes headlines around the world, uh, when investors look at it, uh, you know, what do they think? I mean, how does it in fact affect the investment climate potentially? What is the potential effect it could have uh, for India? Well, people uh, worry, right? Because uh, uh, first, uh, they, they certainly do, th uh, you know, think about the consequences down the line, um, you know, days when uh, their factories can't function. Uh, because of problems. Now, we are no, not there yet. Let me emphasize uh, that we are some distance away from that, but it is something that we should start worrying about given the kind of fuel uh, that is being fed to this fire by our, some of our politicians. Uh, but, but I think the other thing they think about is, do I really want to do business with a country which, uh, you know, uh, undermines its minorities, mistreats its minorities? Uh, certainly when you look at China, and what they've done with the Uyghurs, uh, they have got a lot of pushback in the United States, in Europe, uh, from their treatment of the Uyghurs. There are, there are you know, uh, now sanctions against goods that are produced there. Uh, but there are also increasingly, uh, you know, uh, motions by shareholders saying, we want you to stop doing business in these areas with these kinds of people and so on. Uh, so my, my sense is civil society also plays a part once uh, these things become really prominent and become prob uh, it becomes problematic for a country, especially if it wants to engage. Uh, certainly at the uh, politician to politician level, they may overlook some of these things because of uh, real politic. They really want to, uh, you know, work with you because there's a, uh, there's a third party they, you're both enemies with. But when it comes to civil society in these countries, they also play a role. And it is important to have an image of being a tolerant, respectful democracy. I think that serves us well. Well, it's interesting that you, that you said uh, that it's important to have an image of being a tolerant, respectful democracy. Are we that today, Raghuram Rajan, very honestly? Uh, you, you said something very interesting over the weekend. Uh, where, you, where you talked about the importance of India being a liberal democracy and how some quarters argue that India needs, you know, an authoritarian leadership with few checks and balances and that you fear that we're actually heading in that direction. So are we still, are we still a liberal democracy? Um, I would say less, though, less so uh, than maybe uh, 10 years ago. Uh, I would say uh, that we, if we can do the right things, we can certainly restore, uh, you know, uh, what we've lost. Uh, but I think the further you go down this path, the harder it becomes to go back. And that is why it's very important for everyone to work towards strengthening our democratic institutions, making sure that parliament works, making sure that our elections are, uh, you know, uh, are vibrant, uh, free and fair, making sure our judicial system uh, treats everyone equally and there, has n there is no bias, uh, you know, uh, towards or against specific communities. These are all things which are bread and butter of strong democracies. These have been our bread and butter, and certainly in many places, they still are our bread and butter. But we should constantly uh, be vigilant to slippage, because uh, often, as you slip, uh, it becomes uh, a faster and faster slide, and it is very, very hard to go back.
part of uh, you know uh, becoming perhaps a, a, a more authoritarian democracy which some think we are today is the over centralization of power and how does that then impact you know economic decisions that are taken i mean you can see that for instance center state relations are terrible at the moment uh, states are fighting with the center constantly uh, about gst for example uh, how is that affecting uh, just basic reforms that the government may want to undertake like gst well, I, I, I think, uh, you know, democracy uh, works well when there's dialogue, uh, dialogue between all parties. A and so, yes, uh, sometimes you feel democracy, you know, hinders you, doesn't let you take strong decisions. But sometimes that's for the good, because uh, strong decisions can be wrong decisions. And uh, sometimes strong decisions, uh, but with the tempering, of the views of others can actually make them palatable and therefore effective decisions. Uh, I think in the last few years we've seen a number of decisions, demonetization for example, uh, which were taken without, now with demonetization you couldn't have wide consultation, but nevertheless it turned out in my view to be a wrong decision. Uh, there are other decisions which have been taken hurriedly without widespread consultation. The farm bills which were withdrawn are an example. So. Um, in a democracy, it works when you have a dialogue. Now, it need not be an endless dialogue. You can have a dialogue, have give people a sense of participation, let them modify certain elements, and often you find they know what the ground realities are better than a small coterie sitting in the prime minister's office. And therefore, uh, they can actually ameliorate those decisions, and those decisions have greater staying power. I really think that when we bypass the process of consultation, we think we are taking bold decisions. Often we are taking decisions which won't have the kind of impact that the country needs. I'm sure you didn't expect this and you're not a politician, but it was interesting that the government did uh, look at your remarks over the last few days and chose to talk about them in parliament to make their case for why India is doing better economically uh, versus the rest of the world. The BJP even said that, look, if our own critics uh, are praising us, then we must be doing something right. What did you, what did you make of that, if anything? You know, it, it was interesting, the word critic. I, I, I think what I try and do is offer as balanced a view. The problem is that you know balance often requires also criticism there is a view from this government that only those who constantly clap are in the right because the government does no wrong i mean every government does wrong i, I have criticized the upa government when i was not part of that uh, the establishment and i worked with the previous nda government i have no sort of uh, uh, sort of reason to be um, excessively critical but at the same time some criticism is warranted so uh, don't label people who offer some criticism critics and therefore dismiss them except when occasionally they say you know we're not in the situation of Sri Lanka as far as uh, the economic situation goes I mean that's something which is very obvious and uh, certainly we don't want to scare off foreign investors by saying we have some big problem coming. We're not in that situation right now. Does that mean everything is right and everything is fine and, and therefore uh, we should all be clapping? Absolutely not. We talked about some of the problems earlier. Let's be aware of the problems we have and be constructive uh, both outside and inside government on how we will tackle them. That's the only way we will move forward as a nation. But there is a lot of speculation about whether you would make a transition to politics. You were at a Congress event uh, a few days ago. Uh, is, is there any plan to, to actually join politics? No, I, you know, I actually work with the DMK government in, in Tamil Nadu. I'm on a council where we talk with the, uh, with the Tamil Nadu government. So uh, I am an economist. Uh, I help whoever asks for my help if I can give it. And uh, my uh, real aim, as far as possible, is to make sure that uh, we progress as a country. So uh, no, I have no. Uh, I I was invited by Mr. Shashi Tharoor. He said, it, you know, I should take a look at what's going on in Ch Chhattisgarh. I went there. I looked at some of the development. Was quite impressed by what was going on. And uh, you know that was uh, that was the payback for for actually showing up at that that uh, conference. Finally, uh, Mr. Rajan, just c coming back to the world economy, you know, uh, 
we, we started this program with the numbers of how things are really not good in so many uh, leading economies. We have a conflict, Russia, Ukraine, and now, I mean, we have tensions today uh, between the US and China over Taiwan. What, what, are they, what is the impact that this may have then on, on all of us uh, economically in the near future? Well, we are in uh, difficult times. Uh, certainly, there is high inflation, which the Fed is trying to curb with, uh, with higher interest rates, similarly with the RBI in, in India. Uh, I think that uh, growth, uh, even after they curb inflation, is a big question mark, again, around the world, uh, both in the United States and, and in India. How do we get strong, sustainable growth? What are the things we need to do? And I think what this needs is really a uh, very strong imagination, leadership, and reforms. Uh, I think they're possible. So in, in the last few days in the US, we've seen some movement towards green investment, for example. That green investment could be a very important step forward. In India, I think if we can find ways to use the G20 mechanism to open up the world to our services, I think that would be a very important positive step because we have a lot to offer in services. That's the place we've made a lot of uh, positive movement, of course, in the past. So I, I, I would argue that we need to do something there. Uh, and, and, and so my sense is when you're in difficult times, you find that there is a lot of possibilities. You can, you can actually generate new sources of growth. We need to look for that. We need to persuade people uh, that those are ways uh, worth going on. And, uh, and that's where the democratic process can help. So, so yeah. um, on the one hand, downsides. On the other hand, I think that's the time you look for potential upsides. And I'm sure we will find there's so many challenges we need to uh, deal with. We will find some solutions. Very quick last question. It, it just came to me as you, as you were speaking about this. We, we've seen you know, the Chinese uh, economy, is, is, it's slowing down. And one of the biggest criticisms of the Chinese government has been its obsession with the zero COVID policy and these constant returns to lockdowns, which have really hurt manufacturing and, and supply chains around the world. There, is there not an opportunity for India here? Uh, there is. And, and why aren't we able to, to hone that in, in, in the sense that why, why are we seeing manufacturers going to Vietnam and not coming here? Well, we're seeing some come to India. People are coming. Let's not dismiss that. But you're right that uh, we should be getting far more of them coming here. And it goes back to some of our deficiencies, right? Uh, the, our manpower, uh, you know, uh, we need uh, a more skilled uh, uh, labor base. Uh, our infrastructure, we still need to work on it. Uh, logistics, I mean, these are all things certainly the government has been working on, uh, but we need to do far more on it. A and my sense is if we create that environment, if we create a welcoming environment, not to sort of push back on uh, big foreign investors and say, we, we really don't need you, but treat them uh, with, uh, uh, with kindness, welcome them in and give them a stable environment. I think far more people will come into India. So I, I think a lot can be done here. I think we can create a lot of jobs from this movement away from China. It's not so much movement away from China as diversification. People want a second source, a third source. Exactly. And it shouldn't be just Vietnam. It should be India also. I think we can do that. But we need to find the right mix of, of policies. But also, we need to be really welcoming. Raghuram Rajan, always a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you very much for joining us on NDTV tonight. Thank you. Thank you.